Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Happy Thursday. I think that, that today may be a crash course in how the Republican Party actually works and the role of the entertainment wing versus the uh, the more formal wings of uh, the Republican Party. Uh, and joining us on the podcast, uh, good friend Lucy Caldwell, political strategist, member of the advisory board at the Renew Democracy Initiative and founder of Mockingbird, which is an audience intelligence platform. Okay, so that's not an oxymoron, right? Audience intelligence program. <laughs> I'm just, I'm on just wondering. whom you ask, no. Charlie. Thanks for having me. And and back in the distant mists of time, it feels like the before times, this, this kinder, gentler era before the world we live in right now, uh, Lucy also managed uh, Woke Joe Walsh's 2020 presidential campaign. So that was a baptism of fire. That must have been a wild and woolly ride. It's funny because people will say to me when they learned that I did that, which I actually have to blame people like Bill Crystal and Sarah Longwell for finding myself in, in that position of of running that, yes, wild kamikaze campaign. People will say, so tell me about your career. And I'll say, well, I'm a masochist. So <laughs> no, but in, in, in that race, you know, people will say like, oh, were you part of Joe Walsh's staff years and years ago? And I'm like, no, <laughs> because of course, before woke Joe Walsh, there was Tea Party Joe Walsh. Oh, yes, absolutely. I actually am old enough to remember all of that. But this you described as a kamikaze effort, and which, of course, it was, given the nature of the Republican Party. But you really, you and, and Joe both uh, got to see very, very much uh, up close and personal what, what's been happening with the Republican Party, how it was transforming itself uh, into a cult of personality, and how difficult it is to get any sort of traction in the party. And in so many ways... It's gotten worse. And I, I actually am kind of blending a couple of things together because we can talk about uh, Donald Trump's continuing hold on the Republican Party because, of course, there's, there's still a little bit of a question over that. But just in terms of politics, in terms of the toxicity, and just in terms of the, I'm sorry, the stupidity, the spread of the, just the craziest crackpot stuff, you knew it was bad in 2020. Could you ever guess that it was going to get so much worse in 2022? I guess I should have. Yeah. I guess we all should have. I didn't. It's weird. So the the bulk of the Joe Walsh primary challenge to Donald Trump was in 2019, right? So, and 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 as were the challenges by folks like Governor Bill Weld and and Mark Sanford as well. A lot of credit due to Bill Weld's team. But so we all were operating on a few premises in 2019. One, that Republican primaries would be held, which they were eventually yeah. canceled. Which is remarkable. I mean, it, yes. it's really remarkable to note that they actually didn't hold the primary. They literally canceled the elections. They canceled the elections. And at the time, I remember a reporter telling me, a person who was covering the Republican not so primary campaign mm. that he'd been given a briefing by some of the Trump slash RNC team who were saying things like, we just think the key is we're just, I mean, they were, pr they were proud of it, right? This was out in the open. They were proudly talking about their plan to make sure that Republican presidential primaries were not held in 2020. But there was a sense at that point. So this is like summer going into fall of 2019. One, that there was still kind of a lane for, another kind of Republican and that you could, you could come at it from several different tacks. One tack would be, uh, uh, Donald Trump is not conservative enough and, you know, he claims he wants to build a wall, but he hasn't. And he's just throwing like contracts to his crony friends. Another was the kind of decency argument, a lot of the arguments that we're still making. We launched Joe's campaign at the end of August, going into September of 2019 and at that point, this is right after that, within a couple of weeks was when the news of Ukraine broke, right? Of the right. of the fateful phone call. And we'd like you to actually, do us a favor. Exactly. And we actually believed at that time, oh my gosh, we might get out of this race because someone like Mitt Romney might get in now, right? There's still time. Or like maybe Larry Hogan is going to get in. I mean, we were so daft 
<laughs> about the direction we were headed. And it's now why now, you know, everything began everything about that campaign at that point. We believed when that news of the perfect phone call came out that there was going to be a big sea change, right? Yeah, actually, and, the last six years feels like waiting for a Godot. I need to go back and read that play. Everybody's waiting for someone. Someone will definitely step up now, right? Somebody will really draw the, the red line now. and Step up. And yep. also, or that maybe finally his his hardcore base, right? Like the in both in electeds and voters like the Kevin McCarthy's of the world and rank and file Republican voters Mitch. for a long time. We were, we were, yeah, we were like operating under this misconception that there is something that he could do that would be enough for them. And they throw up their hands. And we learned then I learned then I watched even kind of so-called, well, I won't say never Trump, but but Trump suspicious, anti-Trump Republicans in these states, I was spending a lot of time in places <laughs> like Iowa and New Hampshire at the time, close ranks around Trump instead. They were like so attacked and offended by the that first impeachment that we actually, and I supported that impeachment, of course, but mm -hmm. that we actually really, really lost momentum by virtue of that. And ever since then, I, I never, ever, Charlie, I never... I, I learn about the latest affront by Trump or McCarthy or whatever. And I now, and maybe you feel this way too, but people are like, will this be the breaking point? I no, there's no bottom. <laughs> there's no bottom. <laughs> I think that's been established, but, and yet there still is this belief out there, but, but surely this, this grand jury will do X, Y, and Z. No, they, the, the point you're making here is, is crucial is that they, he draws uh, strength from the attacks, that the, the stronger uh, the, some of the pushback against him is, uh, the more people become defensive, the more indefensible uh, he, be, he becomes, the, you know, the higher the pressure to not break ranks in any way, which fast forward, let's bring us to right now what we've been talking about over the last few days. Let's talk about Kevin McCarthy. This is one of those those tricky points where it's so easy to be misunderstood because I've written extensively about, you know, how incredibly pathetic Kevin McCarthy is, how hypocritical he is, how his self-humiliation has been one for the ages. So I was on one of the cable shows when the latest audio tape was released of uh, some of the comments that he made uh, in the wake Tuesday. of January 6th, where for, you know, for like five minutes, he had this attack of conscience. He had this Tuesday night decency. What was the, Tuesday uh, night? And, and he quickly snuffed it out. And, you know, which Tucker is Carlson necessary was Tuesday now to save his, uh, okay. his career. Night, yeah. But the tape they released on Tuesday night was, was him talking to his Tuesday fellow Republicans, night. essentially telling them Tuesday to cool night. it, that things were too intense, that they should stop attacking one another, that it was a too dangerous a period. And I'm sitting there listening to that going, you know, I got to say, this doesn't make him sound that bad. Uh, in fact, it makes Kevin McCarthy sound like the grown up in the room as somebody who was behaving as a as that rarest of things these days, a a, a you know responsible Republican leader. And, and, and then it occurred to me that this is what might bring him down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that 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 the more decent i mean i'm, I'm sure that kevin's off again you know, kevin mccarthy's office sitting listening going that that doesn't make us sound bad that we're that we're calling out matt gates and you know saying that they shouldn't be saying crazy nutty things out there because this is not a time to be you know taking shots and um they're probably thinking that this isn't so bad now of course the rank hypocrisy because like you know 10 minutes later it's mccarthy who's attacking liz cheney and mccarthy who's leading the lynch mob but sure enough Sure enough, by Tuesday night, the entertainment wing of the Republican Party was in full cry against this moment of adult uh, do your duty leadership. And we haven't done this in a while on the podcast. This is from Tucker Carlson's broadcast on Tuesday night. And Kevin McCarthy of California told his close friend Liz Cheney that he hoped the social media companies would censor more conservative Republicans in Congress. Donald Trump, the sitting president, had already been silenced by those companies, but McCarthy wanted the tech oligarchs to do more, to force disobedient lawmakers off the internet. Quote, quote, can't they take their Twitter accounts away too? Those are the tape recorded words of Congressman Kevin McCarthy, a man who in private turns out sounds like an MSNBC contributor. 
And yet, yeah. unless conservatives yeah. get their act together right away, Kevin McCarthy, or one of his highly liberal allies, like Elise Stefanik, Ooh, is very likely to be Speaker Stefanik. of the House in January. That would mean we will have a Republican Congress led by a puppet of the Democratic Party. Puppet. Okay, so there you have it. All right, Lucy. Let's let's Highly let's play this ally, Elise <laughs> Stefanik. That was my favorite part. I know that was that was that was a gem there. So here we have now over the weekend, everybody was thinking, okay, Kevin McCarthy has the blessings of heaven from Margalago. Donald Trump is really happy um, to you know the fact that uh, Kevin McCarthy is on his knees and he's a wholly owned subsidiary, etc. So it looked like that Kevin McCarthy was going to survive, but now Tucker Carlson. Matt Gates, they are all out. The knives are now out for Kevin McCarthy. Give me your sense of the dynamic in the Republican Party. Does does Trump stick with him or does the full on attack by the entertainment wing mean that Kevin McCarthy is toast? Well, it all comes down to how much Donald Trump decides he does or doesn't need Kevin McCarthy. And I think Kevin McCarthy needs Donald Trump a lot more than vice versa. I think well, I say this a lot every time there's an... So I often think about in the kind of never Trump frame, maybe you think about this too, Charlie, the grace it requires to grant people off ramps, right? Yeah. So after January 6th, when a little crew of ex-Trump administration officials decided that they were now, they'd woken up and cared about democracy, right? The idea that you have to give people off ramps, and it's very hard. And I've actually had a lot of conversations with my friend Joe Walsh about this. And we have had a discussion where I say things to Joe, like we gave you an off ramp, <laughs> right? Yeah. We have to keep giving people off ramps, right? And so, so I think about this in terms of off ramps. And one of the hardest things about the off ramp, p- ramp piece that is bleak, bleak news that I'm here to tell you is that ultimately the, the Republican party is getting so much worse all the time and just is continues its Dante Inferno st- spiral down into, Please. you know, like a depth ring of hell that we could not have imagined. That who we think is on the side of democracy versus autocracy changes all the time. And in the last few months, we've seen not only that we have pretty palatable Republicans who've come over, people like Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, People who voted for Trump, right, which to me seemed out of the question by November of 2020. But now we even have people like Mitch McConnell, right? Like Mitch McConnell is now a person who's become key enemy of Trump because Mitch McConnell has said things that do not pass muster in the Trump in the Trump wing. And so Kevin McCarthy is just potentially the side of loosely kind of pro-democracy grows bigger, not big enough to counterbalance the pro-autocracy side that is today's GOP. So do I think that that McCarthy is going to become persona non grata? Absolutely, I do. Do I think that Tucker Carlson will prevail in this sort of new, I mean, you've got Judge Janine, whomever, OAN, <laughs> yes. whatever the hell, my pillow. Yes, they are all going to come for Kevin McCarthy. And Kevin McCarthy is going to do what Kevin McCarthy does best. And Kevin McCarthy also is kind of a moron. So that's a factor here, yes, right? Yes. He's not crucial, like a brilliant crucial data strateg- point. Yes. moron. He's not like a brilliant strategist a la, you know, like a, he's not a, a political savant like Mitch McConnell. He's not playing three-dimensional chess here, right? This is Kevin McCarthy. He for sure is just going to get tossed to the wayside. We'll probably have like Marjorie Taylor Greene as speaker if it, <laughs> if it keeps going this way. So I, I hate when people, this is, I guess, what we talked about at the top, but every time that I hear people say like, well, maybe there's finally some movement because Kevin McCarthy was speaking out. No, he's just going to get moved to the other column. Right. 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 He's going to get moved to the other column. Uh, I just want to go on record to saying I completely agree with you. I mean, first of all, this is the crash course in the new Republican Party, which uh, in in which the entertainment wing of the party is the beating heart of the party. It is the id of the party. And uh, power flows, uh, you know, from that wing to the institutional wing. You know, any 
any myth you have that the quote unquote elected leadership of the party is in fact the leadership of the party is very naive. And secondly, the idea that Trump is the complete leader of the party misses the point. Trump always keeps his finger on what the hardcore MAGA base wants. He always listens to the entertainment wing. His loyalty is, as we know, very temporary. He's completely capable of throwing somebody under the bus. But it's extremely rare that he allows much daylight to occur between himself and this group because these are the the hyper loyalists. So, I mean, let's do the math here. And I know that people get upset when we do this sort of, you know, future punditry. But let's imagine that the Republicans have uh, 230 seats in the next Congress. Does that seem unreasonable? Do you think that's low? Do you think that's high? Yeah, that seems about right. Okay, let's 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 assume that. Let's just go with that. So you need 218 votes to be elected speaker which means he's got 12, only 12 or 13 members of the House can destroy Kevin McCarthy's dream. And there's, I think there's at least 12, 13, 14, 15 people who will be in that sort of weird fever swamp MAGA land. And this is the problem. This is why he has been sucking up to Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is why he is so reluctant to break with, you know, the crazies, the Louis Gohmerts, the... Paul Gosar's, maybe Madison Cawthorn, but why he's been so reluctant? Because he, even with a majority, even with a rather healthy majority, uh, he's going to be, it's going to be a close call for him, for him. And, and Kevin McCarthy just doesn't have the, he doesn't have the skill to maneuver that. So Donald Trump, all that Donald Trump has to do is fall silent and they will cut him apart. I mean, the knives will be out, yeah. bleed out. Totally. There are so many other members who are chomping at the bit to take Kevin McCarthy's past and future job, who are doing a much better job of threading the needle between uh, pandering to the crazies, and by crazies I just mean mainstream Republicans, and also keeping it together enough that they could seem like they could actually conceivably be Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. People like like Chip Roy is a perfect <sighs> example. And you should we should look to people who were doing things like getting in the thick of the Elise uh, Stefanik Cheney replacement fight to start to see people who were in the thick of that. Those are people who have their eye on Kevin McCarthy's job now. Well, okay. So one, one more thing on this, then I want to move on because I want to talk about a couple of other things, including Elon Musk and Twitter and this amazing story out of Utah, which I don't think we have spent enough time talking about. So Matt Gates put out a statement. Uh, apparently he was very, very upset at the House conference meeting on, uh, on uh, Wednesday, and he was complaining about McCarthy's criticism. And then he puts out this statement. Let me just read it because there's another little delicious gem here. Representative McCarthy and Representative Scalise held views about President Trump and me that they shared on sniveling calls with Liz Cheney, not us. This is the behavior of weak men, not leaders. Folks know what I think because I tell them clearly, directly, as I did when I held the largest event in Wyoming political history without a rodeo element, whatever, days after uh, those recordings were taken. While I was protecting President Trump from impeachment, they were protecting Liz Cheney from criticism. They deemed it incendiary or illegal to call Cheney and Kinzinger anti-Trump, a label that both proudly advertised today. On the bright side, you no longer have to be a lobbyist with a $5,000 check to know what McCarthy and Scalise really think. You just have to listen to their own words and they disp- as they disparage Trump and the Republicans in Congress who fight for him. Okay, the gem there is he's throwing Steve Scalise as well. So <laughs> they're going after Elise Stefanik. They're going after, I mean, this, these folks not only have their knives out for McCarthy, I mean, they are going for the whole leadership team, which has spent the last 15 months sucking up as hard as they possibly can to Donald Trump. And it's not going to work for them, I don't think. I know, but all of these people, everyone who's ever been close to Trump, right? Whether it's Michael Cohen or... Uh, you know, any number of these people, any of the cabinet secretaries, any time in their life, right, in in Donald Trump's life, they all believe that somehow they are different. (laughs) And they're all lemmings. You know, know. you think of like, you just watching lemmings sort of walk off a cliff, like they all think, but for me, it will be different. For me, 
I will be able to reason with him. He will never turn on me. And now it's the Republican Party sort of by extension. They all think that they're going to make it through the gauntlet and no one makes it through the gauntlet. They just do not. So let's talk about maybe some positive developments. As I mentioned, uh, something rather extraordinary happened in Utah that I don't think has happened really anywhere else. And and uh, second look at, or a second look, or another look at Elon Musk and Twitter. Let's do that right after this. Let me tell you a story from last week. The folks from Eden Pure sent me some samples of their thunderstorm air cleaning ozone system. I have to say that I wasn't sure how this was going to work because they're very light and compact and somewhat small. And my wife was a little bit skeptical. I have to tell you, I was blown away by this product. The proven oxy technology destroys viruses, odors, mold, and more. It cleans the air of all allergy-causing particles so you can breathe easy again. I put one in a downstairs bathroom and the other in our bedroom. And I have to tell you, it has completely changed the environment of the entire house. There is that sense of ozone. I said to my wife the other day, I said, just come upstairs. I want to show you something. We start walking up the stairs and I said, you notice that? She goes, wow. I wasn't expecting that because it feels like all of the windows were open and you could feel the sea breeze coming into the house. I cannot believe how effective this is. It freshens your house, gets rid of the odors like litter boxes, trash cans, cigarette smoke, diapers, cooking smell, and more. And there have been more than 200,000 of these thunderstorms sold, so you know it works. But you are going to be really surprised about how it just changes the entire environment of your house. It's not just that you never breathe dirty air again or you don't have filters to buy. It doesn't take up any floor space. It just plugs directly into the wall. It's nearly completely silent. So it is great for use in bedrooms. And it comes with a six-foot USB cord. You can take it with you to travel for clean, fresh air in hotel rooms. And it's not in the same category as other air freshers. Take my word for that. So go to EdenPureDeals.com, discount code CHARLIE3, the number three, to save $200. That's three thunderstorm air purifiers for under $200. And the shipping is free. Okay, we are back with Lucy Caldwell, political strategist, founder of Mockingbird, an audience intelligence platform, who also actually managed Joe Walsh's Kamikaze 2020 presidential campaign. We've been talking about the spiraling of the Republican Party. This story out of Utah is really interesting to me. Uh, Just a little bit of background there. Senator Mike Lee is running for re-election. It's a very, very Republican state, but He has transformed himself from a quote unquote constitutional conservative into somebody who was actually texting the Trump White House about how to overturn the election. Independent Evan McMullen, who many of you know, actually ran as an independent back in 2016. Evan McMullen is from Utah and is running as an independent, as an anti Trump, Trump skeptical conservative independent, as a third party candidate. And over the weekend, Utah Democrats took a very, very pragmatic position. They recognized that in Utah, there was no chance that a Democrat would ever be elected to the United States Senate, and that the only way that they would ever defeat Mike Lee is if they basically decided to make common cause with Evan McMullen. So the Utah Democratic Party decided not to nominate a candidate for the U.S. Senate to take on Mike Lee. So Mike Lee now is facing Evan McMullen, this independent who has put together kind of an unusual coalition, the coalition that people like you and I had been talking about, but have not really seen until now. So, you know, on the scale of BFD, where would you put that, Lucy? Well, first of all, Utah is a complete political anomaly and has been for a while, but that does not take away from how amazing and what a huge BFD this is. It's really incredible that this has happened. And not only did the Democratic caucus decide not to push out a a Democratic candidate bound for defeat inevitably, but there are Democrats who are prominent Democrats who are actively campaigning and working as surrogates for Evan McMullen's campaign. People like Ben McAdams, who's the mayor of Salt Lake, I believe. Former congressman, right? Yeah. And meanwhile, on the other side, 
Mike Lee is facing a pretty serious Republican primary challenge from a uh, a woman named Becky Edwards, and I may botch this, but essentially she's like, you know, BYU royalty connected to the BYU football team somehow, which is a huge deal in Utah and is a Biden supporting Republican. And Mike Lee obviously takes that challenge seriously too, because Club for Growth was running independent expenditures against Becky Edwards as recently as last quarter. And so I mention that because Mike Lee, you know, Evan McMullen's team doesn't have to worry about any kind of race until November, which can create momentum challenges too. But in but in general, he doesn't have a fight until November. He can do everything, all of their energy can be focused on gearing up for that general election. But Mike Lee has a serious enough primary challenger that that he's taking it, he has two really serious races to get through, the primary and then facing Evan in the general. And so it, it Utah is really shaping up to be a super, super interesting and meaningful race. But again, Utah is an anomaly. In the last right, gubernatorial right. race in Utah, the the Republican and the Democrat cut their both campaigns spent money to cut an ad together where they like held hands and said, you know, Utah is a place of political decency, which it is. And so I, you know, I don't look for this to be replicated in your own backyard, <laughs> but no, it no, is no. really it, cool. It, no, I, I agree with you. It's not likely to be replicated, but it, it is interesting because we've been talking about this for some time. You know, is there a third way? Is there a coalition out there? If you do, if you really do think that democracy faces an existential threat, uh, are you prepared to act like it? So you can imagine that there are a lot of longtime Republicans and longtime Democrats who feel a little uncomfortable with the idea of this kind of fusion. I mean, Evan McMullen is way more conservative than, than most Democrats. And imagine some Republicans are thinking, well, is something wrong here that, you know, we're we're now making common cause with the former Democratic congressman from this area. But I do think that, you know, what we've we've learned is that, you know, members of the GOP have, you know, chosen to ally themselves with some pretty fringy characters, you know, uh, white nationalists, other extremist groups, anti-government groups, these conspiracy theories. And and so if you make these kinds of strategic alliances, this might be the way out. But I, your, your point about how it's an anomaly is, of course, important. But I need to spend more attention looking at what's going on because I remember actually talking to Evan McMullen about this race for Senate. And he was, you know, saying how it would be, uh, you know, how it would be winnable and everything. And and I wished him well, although I guess my skepticism about these things is deeply, deeply ingrained. And everything he said that was going to happen has happened. So give him credit there. OK. Yeah. And credit to the Utah Democrats, because oh, they, so. in contrast to all of their Democratic counterparts in most part of the country, instead of saying, no, you know what, let's just focus on turnout of our left flank and we're just going to go all in on defund the police and Green New Deal. They're doing something really practical. They're saying, OK, isn't getting half a loaf in the form of Evan McMullen as our senator instead of Mike Lee better than the whole loaf, which we have no chance of getting ever in the near term? Yes, a great point, because I don't know whether I want to get into student loan and everything, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it looks like they're going to forgive the student loans, which again, and don't DM me on all of this. This is, again, one of the political calculations that let's let's gin up our own base, the this this long term, uh, re very resilient fantasy that that the youth vote is going to turn out for you if you just do stuff for them. And yet I don't think they have any idea how incandescently angry rural and working class voters who they've alienated in the past are going to be when they find out that basically you've just shifted about a trillion dollars in debt from people who actually promised to repay it to everybody else. I don't know. Do you disagree with me on that? I just, I, that's one of those issues where I understand that, you know, when they talk among themselves, this is the, this is the way to get that youth vote back. And yet if they were sitting around going, what do we do about the alienation of working class voters and rural voters? Um, if, if that was their focus, they might recognize this is not a winner. What do you think, Lucy? Yeah, I tend to agree. I'll have to think more about that. I, okay. I do think that that block of voters that you're talking about. I mean, these are not, in my mind, probably not people who are seriously going to the polls each year thinking, gosh, will I 
tick a person with a D or an R at the at the end of their name, right? I mean, these are pretty. The, it, it is, but but Democrats are doing the same thing that Republicans are doing, which is that both parties and Democrats have just avoided having the same kind of reckoning as the Republican Party because they're not like you know like proto fascist, anti democracy, authoritarian dictator wannabes like all the Republicans, but they are making the same kind of error the Republicans have made, which is that all of their energy around turnout is at the polls, P-O-L-E-S, right? They're not really seriously thinking about how to turn out moderate voters. In fact, both parties just completely ignore moderate voters. Exactly, yeah. And so Democrats could be filling that gap, right, of, say, suburban, exurban Republican moms who are really turned off by today's Republican Party, but instead they're out just kind of like slinging for, not the Republican moms, the Democrats, for the 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 AOC agenda. It's a it's a strategic mistake. So let's talk about Elon Musk and Twitter. You made a great point on uh, Twitter yesterday that uh, peop- a lot of people seem to be under the impression that Elon Musk already owns Twitter because he doesn't and he won't probably until quarter number three. So just give me your sense of of, of the back and forth. There, there was apparently this massive Twitter migration over the last couple of days where tens of thousands of liberals left Twitter. If you're a Democrat, you lost you know, massive numbers of followers. If you're a right-wing figure, you may have gained thousands of followers. So um, the right thinks this is the second coming. Um, liberals and progressives are kind of in a state of... Uh, I don't know. Uh, they're, well, let's put it away. They're upset about this. Where, where do you come down on this? Elon Musk, uh, you know, pledging to bring free speech back to Twitter or something. Well, first of all, I don't have a Charlie Sykes size Twitter following, but I lost some followers and I imagine you lost quite a few. I did, haven't taken the time to quantify it because I figured that most of them are bots anyway. So. Yeah. Well, these were like real people. Yeah. I mean, people I know who were quitting Twitter I, you know. hmm. yeah, I despise Elon Musk and I think that oh. he's, hmm. when I was coming up in Republican politics, I always really hated the culture of Republican politics. I mean, I just couldn't stand <laughs> it uh, just across the board, right? When I learned that I was going to be like persona non grata at CPAC, that was one of the best days of my life because I just never enjoyed being around any of these people. And one subgroup that I really did not enjoy being around was the subgroup of people who were like these, well, they weren't all young. They could be any range of age, but basically they had become paralyzed the moment that they were like 14 years old and read, you know, Ayn Rand, right? Like Atlas Shrugged. And they're just frozen in time. And they're just walking around being like, who is John Galt? That is Elon Musk's constituency. And they are super, super ideological in many, many ways. You know, like he's their free market hero. He's the this unbelievable innovator, sort of titan. But they're also, even though they're like these kind of small, like like small government free market people, they are happy to look the other way to the fact that their scion is also a guy who's like basically built all of his businesses on massive, massive government subsidies. Oh, yeah. He has like, sucked at the trough. He has fed deep <laughs> yeah. at the government trough. Yes. And eminent domain. And he's like, like the kind of, he's like a case study in crony capitalism because he takes massive government subsidies and then he turns around and basically uses his his sizable lobbying might and influence to prevent other people from entering the market. So I just despise Elon Musk with every fiber of my being, but I'm not nearly as perturbed by this as other people. I'll say that. Mm-hmm. One, I don't know that this deal is going to go through. Two, I think he's going to lose interest. And three, I really don't like the guy. I'm not quite as cynical about him as other people. I think he's like a lot of billionaires, not really thinking this through or very well informed right. about the actual dynamics at play on Twitter. But I do actually think Elon Musk thinks he's doing something that expands free speech and is good for the the dialogue in the public domain. Uh, do you think that's wrong? Uh, no, I, I I don't. But but I do wonder whether or not he's th- really thought this through uh, for more than five minutes. Some of the things that he said, uh, it would indicate that there's a certain impulsivity. And he, one of the billionaire, you know, I don't know whether you've known him any billionaires, but I, I think there's a billionaire disease 
where they think that they are just so much smarter than everyone else and they don't see their limitations because they are often surrounded by people who will tell yes. them how wonderful they are. So uh, the non-transferability of talents is, uh, is something that, that unfortunately um, a lot of people don't recognize until it's too late. You can be a genius building rockets but be absolutely terrible uh, when it comes to, you know, interpersonal relations or, you know, running a social media platform. I mean, there's a reason why, I mean, you can be a brilliant brain surgeon and be a terrible politician, right? As we found out with certain people. I mean, you can be a brilliant lawyer, um, but not be able to write poetry. I mean, there's just no, I mean, the, the, the most successful coach in the NFL couldn't necessarily you know, manage Amazon.com. I mean, th this is part of the problem is that Elon Musk has this massive ego. He's been so successful. I think, I don't think he has any idea what he's getting into uh, when it comes to all of this. You know, he's talking about, he put out that tweet yesterday, which I described as argle bargle, where he says, by free speech, I mean that which matches the law. I am against censorship that goes beyond the law. If people want less free speech, they will ask government to pass laws to that effect. Therefore, going beyond the law is contrary to the will of the people. That's scary. Okay, I, this That's is scary so thing stupid. To say. This is what I mean. I mean, for fuck's sake, did he think? Has he thought about this for more than five minutes? Because I mean, you know, he, and he appears to think that only government has any role in regulating, you know, what private individuals or outlets can say. And he, then he gets it wrong. And this whole idea, well, if the people want less free speech, they'll have the government to pass these legislation. I mean, really, sort of, you know, what? I mean, does he even understand the First Amendment? That the First Amendment says, no, government cannot pass this legislation? And this whole, you know, the, the people and the power of the people. And then there's the question of, well, I'm not, I'm not going to say no to anything. I mean, why should I exercise independent judgment? You know, like, pictures of mutilated children, jihadi beheading videos, neo-Nazis with swastika, campaigners for abolishing the age of consent. I don't know, people arguing the Jews should be tortured to death. I mean, a lot of things are legal that you wouldn't necessarily want in your house or on your platform. And when I read that tweet, I'm thinking, he's never really sat down and thought about this or the kinds of decisions that he's going to have to make. I mean, he is walking into a shitstorm for which he is not prepared. Totally unprepared. First of all, we could make the public-private argument. It's not that interesting. But in the public square, if you are in a literal public square, sometimes a person who's being abusive or speaking in a way that is really, really inappropriate, I mean, like a literal public square, other people in the public square might shout them down and drive them out of the public square. <laughs> that is a thing that happens in a public square. So he often totally, what the, the public square that Elon Musk seems to imagine is one where, you know, everyone is like wrapped in bubble wrap, right? And we, you just sort of float above the crowd saying just horrible, terrible things and there are no repercussions. That's not how a public square works anywhere. The other thing is that a lot of the now Elon Musk promoters have also been big proponents of things like Section 230 reform and, and really punishing social media platforms right. for how they behave. And, you know, basically, are they publishers or are they actually responsible for this content? Well, if they're responsible for the content, is Elon Musk prepared to, if, if, if his new found friends continue down that road. Is he prepared to take responsibility for the the hate content that is ultimately going to find its way back onto his new toy platform that he'll be paying, by the way, a billion dollars of interest on just to own it? <laughs> I don't know. That's why I think he's going to get bored of this. It's really hard to run a social media company. I've never done it, but I can just... I can just say very confidently, this is going to be a lot harder than Elon Musk I think you're thinks right. it's going to be. I also think this may actually trigger a bipartisan legislative move uh, to uh, to rein in the social media platforms because now you have a, you know, this very strong, very erratic personality with massive power, and he's used to being sort of you know in the background, you know, being able to you know shit post and stuff like that without being held accountable for it. And he's certainly capable of saying things and doing things that will, you know, thoroughly antagonize even the people who are his fanboys at the moment. And 
Republicans and these sort of Tucker followers of the world who are bemoaning, you know, Kevin McCarthy saying like, gosh, I wish people like (laughs) Marjorie Taylor Greene would be thrown off Twitter. They should be careful what they wish for because having people like Donald Trump and these kind of really ugly Nick Fuentes, people like that back on Twitter that's going to help Democrats. I mean, bring it on. Right. That Bring it on. One of the big problems that Democrats and the left have now is that we're not hearing enough ugly stuff from the very worst apples of the rotten apple Republican Party because people like Donald Trump are not on Twitter. They're not out and you're know, giving press conferences, all the stuff that was a thing that really drove momentum for Democrats. So all these righties should be careful what they wish for. I think this is a perfect segue because I'm hearing a lot of the Democrats saying, you know, in the midterms, we should ignore the Republicans and run on our own record. Uh, Pollsters, you know, tell us that democracy is not something to run on. I'm like, why are you guys kidding me? You know, you do not want this to be a referendum on your legislative uh, quote unquote accomplishments. What you want it to be is a comparison, a choice election between you, as flawed as you might be, and the crazy, dangerous, and seditious other guys. They need to highlight them. To So to your point, the more prominence these crazy voices get, the, the easier it's going to be to draw the contrast to say, okay, so um, you may have complaints, as David Frum says, you may have some you know gripes about uh, what, what's been going on, but this election is either us or them, and they are crazy and they are dangerous. And here's another example of how crazy and dangerous these guys are. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I tend to think that's right, except the Democrats are so ineffective that it is hard to imagine that they could manage to find themselves out of a wet paper bag and run a campaign around protecting democracy because they were given power. They control the White House, the legislative branch, they, the House, the Senate. And they suddenly, in the midterms, want us to think that democracy is an urgent issue, but they haven't done anything about it uh, for this the past problem. two yeah. years. Yeah. That is a huge problem. So they have to find their way around that. Do I think they should run directly into these issues and paint Republicans as villains? Yes, I yes, I do. I, I 100% agree with that. But they, they are just, they're, ugh, Republicans are so much better at politics. Why? Why? <laughs> Tell me why. You obviously have thought about this. Well, you know, and, and I know we, we have listeners who are very, why do you say the Democrats are bad at politics? Because they're really bad at politics. And and I, I, I'm i continually amazed by it. So what, what's, Re- what, what's your theory of the case? One piece of this is that I think Republicans take a by any means necessary approach to politics. And I now, as an ex-Republican, who works with Democrats now trying to help them get moderate Democrats elected and save our country from totalitarianism, whatever. I often will have conversations with Democrats where I will propose a strategy and they'll tell me something like, oh my gosh, you know, insert whatever authoritarian, horrible Trump style Mm -hmm. candidate. We have oppo miles long on that person. We could never use it, of course. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> because? It's like the, you know, we they go low and we go high. It's an ethos. They have an idea that they must always have the moral high ground. And you can have the moral high ground for as long as you want. But if you are truly, if you truly believe that you are in a battle for the soul of American democracy, then... I would suggest shedding your attachment to the moral high ground because you're basically, it's like going onto the battlefield with, uh, I was on with uh, MSNBC, I don't know, a few months ago where Jason Johnson said, it's like a track race and Democrats are in like running shoes, right? And Republicans are riding up on motorcycles, right? That's what it's like. You know, you're never going to beat the person zooming around the track on a motorcycle. In fact, he's going to mow you down. (laughs) So you you tweeted out uh, the other day, somebody who wrote, Democrats need to stop complaining about Republicans and develop long-term strategies of their own. And you commented, real talk, everyone should print this tweet and tape it to the bathroom mirror, fridge, computer screen, then recite it morning, noon, and night. What would a long-term strategy look like? Well, okay, 
I also hear a lot of complaining from Democrats about things that were in their control that they uh, just missed the boat on. So, for example, I often hear people bemoaning two things. One, that Democrats are about to lose control of Congress, but also, two, that all these horrible things are happening where people feel like their kids are unsafe, there are book bans, the Don't Say Gay bill, you know, like the crazy Ron DeSantis Disney stuff, you name it. Maybe it's an abortion thing, whatever. All over, there are all these things happening. And Democrats continue to talk about federal races and completely ignore and then are shocked that that their state legislatures are passing reforms that really are impactful on their life. And they continue to not pay attention at all to the government that is in their backyard that is actually not only passing all the stuff they hate, but is also the thing that is going to be what stands between us and uh, a fairly decided election in 2024 because it's state legislatures, for example, who are sending all we're sending alternate slates of electors or talking about usurping the will of voters, whatever. And on top of that, Democrats now are also shocked that all over the country, all of their congressional districts, they're losing seats, right? And the districts have been cut in ways that make it really hard for them, make the path really hard for them in states that they thought were purple or turning blue. And it's like, because you didn't pay attention to redistricting and now you've missed the opportunity and you're going to have to wait another 10 years to do that again. And there were people screaming about this Eric Holder was shouting from the rooftops to them, like, pay attention to redistricting, pay attention to your state legislative makeup, because they're by and large going to choose who con- who controls your state legislature and who your congressional delegation will be for the next 10 years. And they just ignore these things. It's like insane. <laughs> yeah, this is genuinely puzzling because it is so it is so obvious. And I wonder, you know, going back, I remember, um, you know, in the in the really, really before times. Uh, during the Obama presidency, you had you know all of the focus on you know national politics, and I remember seeing the number, the statistic of how many legislative seats the Democrats had lost uh, during Obama's presidency. I think it was like more than nine hundred. Uh, so you know, yes, Barack Obama was a very successful president. Uh, he was successfully you know elected and reelected, but below him, you had this hollowing out of the Democratic Party, which you are now seeing you're now seeing play out. I mean, is this one of the consequences of all of that, that that while they were all focused on the White House, uh, they were losing, I mean, I I think, do you remember that number? Like more than 900 legislative seats, one governorship after another. And the Democratic Party has clearly not recovered from that sort of wipeout at the state level. I think that didn't help, but I think it started happening way before that. And, And I think that it goes way beyond that. I think that Republicans and the right has built infrastructure that Democrats just don't have an answer to. I mean, Democrats have never met a federal omnibus bill that they didn't like, right? Whereas Republicans really are pretty good at thinking about how to build capacity at the state level. And you see it in things like state-based think tanks that are the farm team for uh, you know, not only future members of Congress, but policy that gets enacted all over the country. The, the left doesn't have an answer to the American Legislative Exchange Council, right? Really? It doesn't have an... It, no, not really. I mean, they have like NCSL, and this is like, we could talk about this yeah. all day long. They yeah. have these little entities, but they're not, they don't, they just, they do not have analogs that are answers to the right-wing infrastructure. They don't have a state policy network. They don't have a federalist <laughs> society. And and I think they're, and then they're shocked. Well, they, have the, they have the Brennan Center. Why is the Brennan Center not the left-wing version of the federalist society? Because they're not doing the <laughs> bottoms up, grassroots, uh, you know, like chapter building that the right is doing. They, they huh. have not built that kind of ecosystem. So I remember, you know, I feel like, you know, a present at the creation, I, you know, I, I go back, I'm a little bit older than you. I go back to uh, the early days when they were creating this network and when they were talking about it. And the assumption all along was that this network and these this infrastructure needed to be created because the left was so dominant, because the Democrats had all these institutions and that it was desperately necessary to create something that was a counterweight. 
uh, certainly was not the impression that we, that they would create something that would, you know, would 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 be so much stronger than the Democrats. You, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, there was that sense that that did <laughs> Democrat Democrats on the left control all of you know the higher reaches of politics and academia and government yes. and everything. And, and so we have to find these little redoubts to be able to to challenge them. And it was going to be very difficult. But as you point out, look where we are today. Yeah, and they were fighting left-wing infrastructure. Republicans are the consummate underdogs, right? So everything, <laughs> everything in in dominant culture in the minds of Republicans is liberal, and they're not wrong about that in many ways, right? Like uh, educational institutions, entertainment, Hollywood, right? The media. And so that is a very, that feeling of you have your back up against the wall and you're just, you're in a David and Goliath style fight. That is a very, very motivating yeah. and effective um, <laughs> force to, to building up this kind of infrastructure. Lucy Caldwell, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And we will definitely have you back. Lucy Caldwell, political strategist, member of the advisory board of the Renew Democracy Initiative and founder of Mockingbird, an audience intelligence platform, uh, and has the scars to show from uh, Woke Joe Walsh's 2020 presidential campaign. We will definitely have you back. Thank you for listening today. But before we sign off, do you hate hearing ads on the podcast? Because I have a solution for you. Join Bulwark Plus, where members enjoy ad-free editions of this show and all the podcasts in our Bulwark network, like Beg to Differ with Mona Sharon and The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell. There's also the member-only podcast, The Secret Show, and The Next Level with Tim Miller. You can give a Bulwark Plus membership a try for the next 30 days for free. Simply go to thebulwark.com slash charlie to claim your free trial today. This offer is exclusively for listeners of this podcast, The Bulwark Podcast. That is thebulwark.com slash charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Sohn, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame you that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on, on your podcast, That's the Brown Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, outed you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.